Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship with Spring Branch Presbyterian Church. I'm glad you've joined us this morning. You know, today we're talking again about peace, and this world around us is anything but peaceful. If you look at the demonstrations and you look at people claiming some people are more important than others, and if you look at the peace of mind that we've all seen to be missing lately because of this COVID virus. It's a tough world right now. Well, across our denomination and across our church, we're celebrating a season of peace. And I hope that you'll enjoy this message because I think it's time that we turn to the Bible and we simply ask, who matters? And the answer really might surprise you. Well, we're at home again this week, uh, and we will be um, doing the same kind of broadcast next week. And then it will be World Communion Sunday as we begin to hopefully open things up. Do know that the elders are monitoring the statistics very carefully, and just as soon as it is safe, we'll try to have you right back with us. I miss you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And don't forget, at the end of the service is our virtual narthex. Well, listen to these scriptures and this music and a wonderful prayer this morning uh, for our country and for our city and our state and our church. And then I'll be back in just a moment with a message. Loving and compassionate God, you call us to love our neighbors and to be bearers of your hope and grace in our world. Expand our hearts and vision to respond with compassion to those around us who are struggling in this time of uncertainty, anxiety, grief, and suffering. Loving and compassionate God, you call us to love our neighbors and to be bearers of your hope and grace in our world. Expand our hearts and vision to respond with compassion to those around us who are struggling in this time of uncertainty, anxiety, grief, and suffering. Give wisdom and strength to our health workers and government officials as they provide leadership in bringing our country through this crisis. We bring before you and into our hearts and minds those whose work and income are uncertain those who are isolated, those who are fearful of an unknown future, those who are homeless, and all those who offer them support and care, those who are involved in aged care, our church leaders, staff, and their loved ones, businesses whose futures are uncertain, school staff, and students, those with health conditions that put them at greater risk, 
Give wisdom and care-filled discernment to all our church leaders and local congregations as we seek to creatively live out our worship, witness, and service in ways that offer Christ's life-giving love and presence. Strengthen and sustain us to be your people, shaped by your abundant grace, bearers of your generosity and overflowing love. Through Christ, our light and hope, we pray, amen. Hi, I am so glad you're here today. Pastor Kevin's sermon title today is a question, who matters? As I was thinking about that question, I thought of something Jesus said. He told us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And he also said, love does not harm our neighbors. I also thought about Daniel Tiger on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. He had a really big question that he had to ask somebody. And he asked Lady Aberlin because she's a really good listener. This was his question. Am I a mistake? That is a big question, isn't it? Lady Aberlin listened. This is what he told her. I don't look like any other tiger. I don't talk like any other tiger. I don't know any other tiger that lives in a clock. And he said, I don't know any other tigers that love people. Big worries. And Lady Aberlin listened. And this is what she said. I think you are fine just as you are. You're no fake. You're not a mistake. I think what Lady A was telling him kind of answers the question today. She was saying, you matter. And I think this was what Jesus is saying when he tells us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And that love does not hurt neighbors. Love does not harm neighbors. So yeah, we're all different. We look different, different skin tones. We speak differently. In Houston, you can hear all kind of languages. You can hear Spanish, you can hear German, you can hear French, you can hear Tagalog, you can hear Bantok, you can hear Portuguese, you can hear Greek, you can hear Italian, you can hear Lebanese, many beautiful, rich languages. And if you listen closely, those of us who speak English, we have accents. We can say the same word but it sounds different. You know what? We're not mistakes. I believe we matter to God. And we live in different kind of homes and with different kind of families. And we love different kinds of people. I believe we're not mistakes. I trust that we matter to God. I have a friend who is amazingly talented, smart, creative. My friend shares those talents with so many people in so many ways. He especially shares those talents about people with people who sometimes think they don't matter. He's a very caring person. And my friend is wonderfully different from other people. <sighs> my friend shared a conversation with a family member one time when they were talking about being different. And this is what that family member said. God does not make mistakes. Wow. I think people sometimes feel like they're a mistake. They feel like they don't matter because other people make them feel that way. Make me feel that way sometimes by what they say or what they do. Just because we look a little different or we speak a little different or we live in different houses or we love people differently. It's kind of hard. And I think Jesus is telling us to love our neighbors, to love their differences, to love ourselves, and to love 
our differences. And that when we love each other, we do no harm. And when we love each other, we help people who feel like they don't matter, who feel like they're not being treated fairly, that they're not being treated justly. I think Jesus wants us to tell everybody that you matter. You matter to me, you matter to God, and you matter to Jesus. Let's pray. Our prayer is going to be a song today. I like your eyes. I like your nose. I like your mouth, your ears, your hands, your toes. I like your face. It's really you. I like the things you say and do. There's not a single soul who sees God's sky the way you see it with your eyes. And aren't you glad? You should be glad. There's no one, no one exactly like you. You are not a mistake. I don't think God makes mistakes. And I trust that you, we, all of us matter to God. May it be so. Our Old Testament reading today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepared what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Do, 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 do. I do. 
Our second scripture lesson this morning and the text for today's message will be taken from the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians. We will be reading verses 21 through 30. Listen now to the word of the Lord. For me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. 
so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege, not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Lord, open our hearts and open our minds now by the power of your Spirit. Help us to hear these words and help us to proclaim them not to other people, but first of all to ourselves. Give us the grace to examine our hearts this morning. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. There was once a small church in a big city. Now this city happened to have been a port city and as a result it became known as the most ethnically diverse city in the nation. It was often a struggle figuring out how all of those different kinds of people were going to live together. Some things that are interesting about this particular city is that it had one of the most innovative sports stadiums ever built, and a certain substance was pulled from the ground nearby that helped to make it a very prosperous region. And yet, it was a time of great unrest because the national leader was rather controversial. What city was it? Houston, you say? No, it was the city known as Philippi. <laughs> and it is the setting from the scripture that we read just a moment ago. So welcome to the third in our series that we are calling A Season of Peace. As we look to the scriptures for guidance and we discern what part do we need to play in peace. Now we've seen that peace starts with peace between us and God through Christ. And we have seen that for real peace to be possible, we must come together in repentance and true forgiveness in our hearts. And I believe that we can see that those things happened abundantly in the church in Philippi and that God was blessing the church. Now, as an aside, if you read what the historian of the day says, you know what you find out? you find out that prosperity came to that area because of Paul and what the church started there in Philippi. <laughs> you know, that is truly what God can do. We can be a blessing to our whole area. And I believe it is something that we need now. However, there came a great threat in Philippi. Now, Paul is writing from prison for his faith, probably in either Rome or Ephesus. And as he writes this letter of Philippians, it is the most personal letter that Paul ever seemed to have written, that we have a record of anyway. He's writing to the young Christians there in the church that he has founded. Philippi was a spiritually dangerous place to be. It was filled with many contrasting ideas. The church was always surrounded with all of these philosophies. Someone in that day called Philippi a miniature Rome 
because it served as the gateway to Europe. You may remember that the church started, you can look this up in Acts chapter 16, with the conversion of a woman who was a seller of purple, and her name was Lydia, which means she happened to have been a very wealthy merchant. And when Paul and Silas were thrown in jail, they sang hymns, and the jailer was converted when the doors open. I mean, this was a really exciting place to be, very spiritually active, we could say. And so Paul is writing from prison to give them instructions and give them encouragement. Now, in the, just before the passage that we read a moment ago, Paul writes that he really believes he's about to be released because of their prayers. But until that time, there's only one thing he wants to accomplish with his life, and that is to glorify Christ. In verse 21, he says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He says that even if he were to die, that would be gain, because he'd be with the Lord, and he'd be much better off. But God wants him here for their sake, and he's okay with that too. And he's saying, until that time, we need to live faithfully because one day it will be worth it. There is a prize waiting for us just around the corner. But until then, until that day comes, there's something that needs to happen. What was that something? Why was he writing to them in the first place? in this time when the church is under attack. He says that what he wants is to hear a report from the church that is this report, and I quote, that I will hear of you that you are standing firm in the gospel in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's verse 27. Standing firm in one spirit. <laughs> now, th this was a church filled with people from all kinds of backgrounds. Now, as, as we saw, there are clearly a core of people who had great means, but they came from everywhere, and most of these people, maybe all of them, were something other than Jewish believers. But they developed a reputation in history as being some of the most generous Christians who ever lived. They were known for standing in solidarity with the poorer churches. They were known by the historian of day, the day as living their lives and their faith in a very public way. Somehow, through the power of the Holy Spirit, this improbable bunch had come together into something beautiful. It, it was like a beautiful, colorful mosaic. And now, people outside the church were trying to destroy the church. And in chapter 3, Paul calls them enemies of the cross. And their message, it was easy. Even spiritual sounding in some ways. And if you read this book, the message probably sounded something like this. It's really just all about you and Jesus. Don't worry about anybody else. No need to change. Just go ahead and keep your sins and your prejudices. God understands those things. <laughs> A public witness in this dangerous age, ah, that's overrated. Don't worry about that. Have you ever heard any of those kind of voices? And Paul says that we have to keep striving together. He says there is a real battle going on, but what he wants Christians to do is to wage peace. <laughs> you know, some things never change. Fast forward with me, if you will, to another band of believers in another 
multicultural city on another port in another part of the world, and the parallels with Philippi are so obvious, but so are the tactics of the enemies of the church. And yes, they are still there. And just as in ancient Philippi, I truly believe that the church can be a great blessing to the city around us by modeling great peace and unity that only Christ can bring. But I warn you, it sounds good, but if we're going to live like that, it really means going against the grain. It means living counter to the ideas of the media and those who would love to look out for their own interests. Being a Christian and living for peace is not for cowards. Everywhere you look these days on the news, we see headlines about who really matters and, by inference, who doesn't matter. Well, I want to ask you this morning, in this day and age, who really does matter? And I want to give you three different answers, I think, that we need to say as Christians. Number one, who matters? Christ matters. (laughs) Paul said, for me to live is Christ. To the true Christian, it's not about us. Paul didn't care about prison or comfort just as long as Christ was glorified. That's all he cared about. And to the church, it has to start there as well. That is the only way of peace. It is the only way we'll come together in this life. Paul says he's not even going to boast about his amazing Jewish heritage, even though he could The only thing he wants to boast about is what Jesus did for him. Do we care enough to tell people about what Jesus has done for us? Do we care enough to warn people that judgment isn't just a fable, it's real? No matter who they are, even if they look different from us, even if they irritate us, Do we care more that our needs are met or our own interests are highlighted or that we do what amounts to our tastes? Or would we rather care that when our legacy is known, Christ was glorified? See, we live in a world where the three most important people in our society are me, myself, and I. And listen, there will just never be peace between all of us until we make a decision to break that selfish mold. And you know what? It doesn't matter how spiritual someone can come and make it sound. It's not Christian. It is what happens when we love Christ with all of our heart and our strength and our might. See, when we do that, we find that our perspective changes, which leads me to the second answer that naturally follows if for us to live is Christ. And here's the second one. Everybody matters. (laughs) You know, when I observe how many diverse people were in that church, and when I consider that our guiding principle in life ought to be the love of Jesus Christ, that was broadcast to every single nation on the day of Pentecost, I am just forced to conclude that it's not all about one culture or one heritage as opposed to another. While we certainly honor those, setting one up as better than another is decidedly unchristian. Listen, a godly church is not colorblind. A godly church is a church, is a color honoring church. The church doesn't become one big homogenous mass. Christ told us to go make disciples of all nations, and there was almost a celebration to what he said. 
Do you know what John the Revelator saw as, as he was shown the future and what would the church would be like in heaven? Revelation 7, 9. I just want to read you a little bit of the vision that we're given of the church, the, the vision that we are to strive toward right now. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb. <laughs> One day there will be peace and it will be precisely because each heritage is equally precious to God. And until then, your job and my job is to model that to a world around us. To be like Philippians who stood out because they lived openly as Christians. They were very public. And if we do that, then the final answer I want to give you today falls into place. Who matters? Number three, you matter. See, this is wonderful news, and I want to share it with you. It doesn't matter who you are or what anyone else thinks of you or who has ever tried to marginalize you or who thinks your life isn't worth as much as other people. See, we serve a God who does not make junk. And while Christ paid the price of the sins for the world, there is even better news, and that is that Christ gave his life for you. That's right, you. Why? Because you are deeply loved and completely accepted by the one who made you. In short, you matter. And let no person or no organization ever, ever convince you otherwise. I know that out there there's a fight right now about how to answer that question. But Paul would tell us the same thing as he told the church in Philippi. No, no, no. Just stand together. It'll confuse our enemies. Don Ratzloff retold a story of Vernon Grounds um, called Gordon's Miracle on the River Kwai. Now, the Scottish soldiers were forced by the Japanese captors to labor on a jungle road. And the situation got so bad, nerves got frayed, and they began to attack one another. But then something happened. At a daily tool count, a shovel was found to be missing. The furious Japanese officer demanded that someone produce the missing shovel or else he would shoot every one of them. Finally, one man came forward and took responsibility. And because he did, that officer picked up a shovel and beat the man to death there in the middle of everyone. The survivors picked up his body and carried it for a second tool check. And this time as they rechecked, <laughs> there wasn't any shovel missing after all. No, there had been a miscount at that first check. Wonder began to spread through the camp about this innocent man who had been willing to die to save the others. And he accounts that the effect among them was profound. The men began to treat each other like brothers. And when the Allies finally came to liberate them, the survivors, which by this time were little more than human skeletons, lined up in front of their captors. 
Their captors expected the worst. But instead of attacking them, with one voice, here is what they heard. No more hatred. No more killing. Now what we need is forgiveness. Behold the power of an innocent man who gave his life out of love for someone else. It changes that individual. It changes the church. It changes the community around us. And my prayer, Spring Branch, is that it will change us. <laughs> Dwight L. Moody once said, show me a church where there is love and I will show you a church that is a power in the community. It is my dream and my hope that here at Spring Branch, we would be that kind of power because we have that kind of love. <laughs> Why? Because Christ matters. Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you so very much for giving of your own son. It changes our perspective. It defines who we are in amazing ways. We just can't fathom why anyone would do that. But it has inspired so many through the ages and it has been such a source of blessing that, oh God, we worship you and praise you this morning. I pray, oh God, for those, first of all, who don't realize that you are preeminent in this life, and for Christians who have never truly made you that kind of Lord, Lord, become the only thing that matters for us so that we have your perspective. And Lord, I pray that you would give us each eyes that say we're all important, we're all loved in your eyes. And I pray especially for the one this morning, that one, for whatever reason, who is marginalized and has no idea how much you could possibly love them break through their heart and show them. And as you do, may the power of that love bring forgiveness and peace and be a great blessing to our community. As we pray in Jesus' name. Oh,